Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Herd Fit Podcast with Dr. Sam Marie and myself, Coach David Syverson. This podcast is aimed at helping anyone and everyone looking to enhance their healthy lifestyle through fitness, nutrition, and most importantly, mindset. Welcome back to the Hurt Fit Podcast. I am Coach David Syerson. I'm here with my co-host, Dr. and Coach Sam Ree. We have another fun kind of maybe controversial topic, <laughs> building off our gossip topic from last week. Just kidding. Uh, but no, something more on the semi-serious side, but I um, want you to hear us out. And this is something that's always come up over the years. Uh, I can remember this actually coming up when I started CrossFit well over 10 years ago. Probably I'm looking at, man, I'm getting old, 12 plus years ago. And... This centers around, okay, the athlete-coach relationship and the ability, the physical ability of a coach to do certain movements, work out to a certain standard, and it is a natural and common thing to think, especially when you're new to CrossFit, that the coach should be able to do everything. Superman, superwoman. You should be able to do muscle-ups and snatch 300 pounds and run a mile under five minutes and make the games and make you know semifinals just because you're a coach. And there's a reason why that is an, an, an image. And I want to kind of get into this. Now, I know immediately this is going to go down the path of Dave and Sam are coaches. They're going to have the coaches back. They're defending coaches, and I will tell you this, I'm not. There are certain expectations. I do have coaches physically that I will get into. And amazing, amazing charisma. Yes, amazing. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I also want to look at it like any time there's like a debatable topic, right? You always have to look at it from um, from two different perspectives, maybe even more. And we're going to give the perspective of the athlete that actually thinks that. But then we're also going to give the perspective of the coach that's actually in front of people, right? And between, and between the two of us, we've coached a lot. We've been through a lot, both as coaches and athletes. And I think we have some interesting opinions on it. Some might actually surprise you. Um, it's possible some of it might offend you, but it's also it's all coming from the place of we all need to have a general, strong understanding of both sides of this argument. Sam, opening thoughts, because we actually had a decent talk about this when we talked about uh, this actual topic on Thursday. Yeah, it, it, it was a, a great topic uh, that was brought up basically from some discussion here at the gym. Mm -hmm. Like most of the topics come from yeah. things that happen at the gym. Yep. And after we talked, I did Google and it's funny how much there is out there. If you say, do you expect, if you Google, do you expect your coach to be better than you at CrossFit? Mm -hmm. There's a lot out there. Mm -hmm. And um, it's sort of the same thing that I see. Do you expect your physician to be as healthy as you are or mm -hmm. healthier than you? Good question. Um, and so those are the type of questions you see. And then there are responses. And like you said, it's not all about the coach's side. And there is honestly a lot on the athlete side, and I will throw in one or two responses I saw out there, mm -hmm. and and we can talk about whether they're right responses or wrong responses. Yeah, and like I, I like to almost tie some of these coaching athletes to being a parent because I'm a parent now. My son turns three in a couple of weeks, and <laughs> I, I was laughing at myself the other night that um, I, I just envisioned Brock at some point. I mean, like a lot of kids now, like getting attached to a tablet, a TV show. Like the kid can watch YouTube, kids YouTube, by the way, on his tablet for like an hour and like not blink once. <laughs> and um, the other day I was like, all right, Brock, time to put the iPad away. I was like, stop watching so much of the iPad. And I'm literally sitting there on the phone watching YouTube on my phone and Ash is on her phone <laughs> the same thing. And this is where I think athletes can start to originate this thought is, um, hey, a coach should only be telling me what to do if they do it too, right? Whether it's their lifestyle, their their love and passion for CrossFit, quality movement, RX, not nah, blah, 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 right? Muscle ups, pistols, right? Um, so uh, that's where the, the origin of a CrossFit coach, my personal experience was I started somewhat early, not as early as some others, right? But I really started getting into this in 2011. And at the time, I started at CrossFit Hoboken, which at that time, and still a very well-known gym, was probably the gym in the tri-state area. It was so well-known. Like whenever they ran, ran a competition, people would drive hours for the CrossFit Winter Challenge, at uh, CrossFit Hoboken Winter Challenge. And it was like kind of like the mecca of that area. It's just a lot of people, a lot of members. And I found that back then, every coach that was there could do everything. They had muscle-ups. They had butterfly pull-ups. They could snatch, you know, 80% of their body weight. They could squat snatch. And you just had this immediate, and one of their coaches was a regional athlete. He actually almost made the games one year. And 
you that immediately kind of twisted my initial thought into a CrossFit coach needs to be a really good athlete. They need to have the best scores in the gym. They need to look the best with their shirt off. They need to have every tool in the box refined because that's the only way you can teach it. So that was my original thought when I started CrossFit and I had no idea what I was doing. Did you have any thoughts like that when you started? No, I w did not think about my own capability uh, when I was a CrossFit coach, nor did I. What about as an athlete? As did, an athlete. Did you have an expectation of a coach? Yeah, because I sucked at CrossFit. And this is what a lot of people say on the Internet. I suck at CrossFit, so of course the coach should be better than me. Mm -hmm. In terms of capabilities, we'll talk about what we expect coaches to, sure. to do. Yep. But certainly um, I didn't think I was good at CrossFit. So if I saw someone who was coaching me who was not good at CrossFit or at least not as good as me, mm. I would have definitely not respected. Yeah, that definitely would have been like just like uh, maybe like not respected but not respected as much because you start questioning in your head, does the person that's doing the talking actually believe in what they're talking about right. or are they trying to collect, uh, collect a paycheck? Now, I'm not going to go into what makes a CrossFit coach a good coach, right? I'm sure like we'll probably touch on that a few different ways um, for different reasoning in this podcast, but the origin, origin of bison coaches – Right here at CrossFit Bison, there's a lot of reasons why, and I've said this before, right? Um, there's probably 35 people in the gym that could coach, right? And they, they would do a good job. And it's not necessarily these people are better than those. Um, there's a lot that goes into it. Um, but the, here are the traits that like, I personally look for, all right? They have a passion for CrossFit. They have a strong desire to help others. They have a selfless approach and a consistently selfless approach. They're a team player. Um, with their ability to contribute. They have personality traits that balance out the rest of the staff because you don't want everyone being the same. Um, their current life situation, their availability, right? That's that's a big part of it as well. And then knowledge of CrossFit, movement, nutrition, lifestyle, th the desire to learn more, right? Um, when you have some free time, are you ever looking into a better way to coach a certain movement? Are you trying to learn something for yourself? That's what I mean by knowledge of CrossFit. I don't want someone reciting like the L2 guide to me, right? Um, just someone that is really trying to learn more and just kind of have more, kind of increase their, like we always talk about increasing your aerobic systems to have a better engine. This would be increasing like your baseline knowledge of CrossFit to make you just a better coach. And like, I, I think that's, that's something that I look for. Now, I just listed off what, seven or eight things. Did any of them have anything to do with performance in the gym as an athlete? Not one of them. And that's why it's like I've reflected on this a lot since we decided we're going to do this. I don't think I've ever in – now we're in year 10 – try to get a good athlete to become a coach. I don't think I've ever done it in, in a – like there are certain um, caliber of quality movement and approach to CrossFit and, again, knowledge of how to approach the program. But I don't think I've ever been like, yo, that dude just snatched you know, 245. We got to get him to coach. Or he just did uh, eight unbroken ring muscle-ups. We got to get him to coach. He just was the best athlete in 21.2. We should probably ask him to coach this year. I can genuinely say I've never gone down that path. What are your initial thoughts on – or what are just your thoughts on the Bison coaches? And this is awkward because you're one of them, so you're going to have to try to remove yourself mm. from that a little bit. Mm. And just some of the personality traits that we do and don't have. We bounce each other out. We have different strengths, different weaknesses. But in relation to why are they a good coach? Why are we a good staff? Why, why do we think that they can help bring this community to another level that have nothing to do with workout traits? Um, first thing, I am biased. I am a coach. I'm one of the younger coaches in terms of the, the length of coach that I've been coaching here. Most of the coaches here have been coaching a lot longer. But I do love our coaches Every single one of them, I think they're all amazing coaches. So I'm going to come with that bias, and I know I have it. But that being said, I'm going to ask a couple questions about you choosing coaches. Yeah. The first thing, though, I do want to mention is you mentioned a bunch of these uh, traits or, mm. or things, qualities you were looking for. And it, it actually kind of lines up with what um, – and I've used the, tr the three A's before. The you know When you're looking for someone who you want to hire, they have to have the three A's. Affability, where they can be – Connecting with people, um, availability, so you know the fact that they could actually put the time in, and then ability, like actually know how to do things. And, mm -hmm. the, and the first couple were all mostly approachability, motivation, like passion, desire to help others, selfless approach, team player, personality traits that are diverse. Those show that you really care about how people interact with others mm -hmm. and 
then the other thing was, you know, and their motivation to, to be with others and to coach. And then the other thing was the availability in terms of how their life situation is. Um, are they able to coach? Maybe they're really busy at work. And then ability, which is what you mentioned, the knowledge of CrossFit, movement, nutrition. Mm. Now, what I wanted to ask is when you look at the coaches you hired, did their CrossFit ability play any role? Like what if – would you have hired a coach who couldn't do a single pull-up? Um, good question. The answer is yes. Like I don't, I don't think I would ever not pick a coach because they couldn't do a pull-up, right? But I – one thing I do know – is I would never hire a coach that's been here for a year or even, or maybe even at this point, two years, right? Because you don't know them that well yet. And that, but in those two years, like what kind of progress did they make with quality of movement, caliber of movement, strength, skills? Because in a lot of cases, right, someone that's truly into CrossFit and values fitness and really wants to do all these things outside of the gym to make what the in the gym better, you would see progress with that movement. So if they showed up day one, and there's nothing wrong with this. They needed two black bands to do a pull-up. No judgment whatsoever. And I know that's not always easy to believe, but trust me, there's no judgment there. Don't care if you can do 10 in a row or a zero. Don't, do not care. I care that you want to get better, right? If they in two years are still on two black bands and they haven't really worked on it and you know, kind of have a don't care approach, which again, I still respect. <laughs> if, if that's not your goal, then it's not your goal. But if, if, if you are not making progress with quality of movement and you don't really seem to care that much about it, then I probably wouldn't want you to coach at Others. the gym. Yeah. Okay, how about this? What if – now, when I look at the coaches, they all look amazing, all different shapes and sizes, but they all look very – honestly, to me, they look very right. crossfit -y. Right. Like, would you hire someone who was clinically obese or mm -hmm. just, you know – had issues in terms of that sort of issue. Yeah. I mean, I think we all have that. I don't want to even call it shallow, but all that kind of like, or judgmental. It's kind of like, again, we're all like, I mean, I'll use myself as an example so no one gets embarrassed. Like I'm not the most aesthetically pleasing looking athlete in the world. If you go to a CrossFit competition and I know that, and I'm not upset by it, insecure about it at all. I, but you fit in. Yeah, no, I know. I know I fit in, but you, but I would hate to say I would, and I've had this said about me before, and then the, the person I was at a competition didn't even know I was behind them. It's like, I think I won a comp or second place or something. And like, did you see the guy that won? He's fat. Like he, and I was right behind the person. I just like kind of like nodded my head. Like I laughed because, you know, that, so did it make you feel good in that moment? Absolutely not. So I would, and that, because I've been through that, I would never want to tell someone or even, you know, give this notion to anyone that, yeah, you need to look a certain way to coach. But I do think, and like one aesthetic thing I've always wanted for myself, right? Other than the Sam Rhee abs, all right? <laughs> Wish I knew a plastic surgeon, but anyway, is like, I just want to look like I work out. Like I would, I want to, oh, and that's, that's my shallowness of myself. I want to be able to go anywhere and be like, oh, that guy works out. Like now that I am so entrenched in this space, if I go to the airport, I can tell you like that person works out. I could also tell you that person does not work out. Am I being judgmental? Call me judgmental. But like it's just I'm around it all the time. So that's kind of like I would want someone to have that look. Like they work out. Whether it's muscle tone, whether it's less body fat, whether it's, you know, and you know, Adam Storm's quads, right? Like there's got to be something about them that says they work out. And then you could actually watch them work out and be like, all right, they got their shit together. They move well. They, uh, they breathe well. They don't break down. They, don't, they have a strong midline. They're stable, right? They're consistent. I do value that. That is an expectation I have for coaches is that, you know, what is, you know, clinically obese? What is overweight? You know, like, again, I'll bring myself up. I don't have the look that a lot of other good athletes have, but I can hang with the good athletes. So if I go and tell someone they can't coach because they don't look a certain way, I'm kind of like contradicting what I actually believe in. So if anything, I might even be more biased towards someone that doesn't look like the traditional, you know, Scott Panchik, Rich Froning, Tia, right? So what do you think about that? Because... Your space, Sam, your space, like, we're going to do an interview on you someday because I do think it would be really fun to do about you are in the aesthetic field, right? Am I, do I have that right? Yep. Okay. Yeah. So 
I don't know if like that terminology is right or wrong. So, yes. and their the look matters so much. And because you're around that all the time, and because you are, you know, a very fit looking individual yourself, and so is your wife, right? How much does that weigh to you? And you you can remove yourself from as a coach, you know, like as an athlete. What what do you think about it? Uh, you know, well, there's no doubt, and I know this, and I was about to ask you this, but I'll ask, I'll answer it myself too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I want is, you to. It is easier as a physician and as a coach to be respected by people who just look at you face value if you look like you work out. Done. And that's the reality of life. That is true. That and, is true. And if and fortunately or unfor I mean just because who we have, everyone looks like they work out. Everyone is is um they look very crossfitty. Mm -hmm. And so when you first look at someone before you even know whether they coach, you're like they must be a good coach right. because they they look like they work out, or even it, they might be a good coach, or because, they might be a good yeah, coach. They, they, they've right. they've opened the door, right? <laughs> now, to my opinion, now uh, someone who does not look like that right. might have a harder time yeah. proving to others that they are a good coach. Mm -hmm. It's not impossible, or or by any means, you're gonna have to do a little bit more. You got to do more work, and that's the same reason why Matt Frazier automatically carried more legitimacy as a coach, just because he won, whatever four or five. Uh, championships before Shane Orr was considered a good coach. He had to wait until Tia Claire Toomey won a bazillion championship. Now everyone thinks he's an awesome coach. Great example. So those are the type of things where you have to, some people have to prove themselves more than others just by their appearance or what they've done. Great example is that that's actually a, just a great kind of thing to think about and proof that it's not necessarily Dave and Sam that think this way, right? Matt Frazier <laughs> had never coached in his life retires and starts a training program after he retires thousands of people go and sign up yeah because he what if he what did he accomplish maybe not necessarily what he looks like but maybe part of it for some um i know of another famous games athlete that's going to be starting a master's program soon i don't want to give that up yet but it's um the second he puts it out there thousands of people are going to sign up and the and it's it's that's what credibility is right these guys have credibility because of what they went through, what they accomplished, right? You, as a CrossFit coach, let's dumb this down because you're not a games athlete, right? You're not trying to start your own master's program with thousands of people and make it your career. But let's just say you just, you just got hired to coach at a gym. There is going to be some credibility or a lack of credibility based on your aesthetic, right? But then also what you can do with your body, what you do in the gym. And that also centers around what you do with your lifestyle, so what are things that we think a coach should be capable of physically, right? And remember, we have coaches that do cross the coach CrossFit from a wheelchair, right? Uh, Kevin Ogre is the, kind of like the guy that kind of stands out my head. Yeah. Really unfortunate accident, uh, paralyzed doing a snatch at a competition years ago, and has become a, a, like a, a face of CrossFit for the uh, for the adaptive adaptive community. So you know you're not going to tell him that he's got to be capable of doing certain things as a coach, but let's take the extreme cases out. And are there certain movements that every coach should be capable of doing? Are there certain loads they should be able to hit across all lifts? Um, or is there a certain percentage of workouts that athlete should or that coach should be able to do RX prescribed? Right? I want to talk about those three things: the quad, uh, what movements, what kind of loads, and then what percentage of workouts should they be able to RX? And you know there are flaws in all of those, right? Because it comes down to programming, right? If you follow Bison programming, it's going to be probably a little bit tougher than, you know, your random gym down the street where they don't really go after it that hard. So a coach there could RX everything. A coach here cannot RX everything, right? Um, what movements do you think a coach absolutely needs to have down at a pretty high level? I'm going to pull comments that I found on Reddit, and okay. you can tell me what you think about each one of these things. Okay. So the first thing about certain movements, this was a pretty common thought. Gymnastic skill mastery for a coach should be a little more than what's included in the open workouts. So kick up into a handstand, wall walk relatively smoothly, double unders, pull-ups, toes to bar. I'd be more understanding if they couldn't handstand walk or do ring muscle ups or BMUs. Okay. How do so, you feel about that? I mean, I think that's a, a general statement, right? Um, I don't think it's like a template, like you have to be able to do toes to bar and pull-ups and chest to bar pull-ups. Um, I mean... For a coach, any coach? That's sort of the expectation movement-wise? I would say any gymnastics movement that you don't – so I, I have like – in my head, I have different level of skills, right? Like ring muscle-up, handstand walks, 
bar muscle ups. I think those are high skills. Then I have like chest bar, wall walks, even regular pulps, hand, kipping handstand push ups. Those are like medium skills. And then you have low skills, um, burpees, handstand holds against the wall, maybe even like a regular kipping pull up, not even butterfly, um, a toes to bar, maybe not stringing them together yet. That's more like medium skill. I do believe at some point a coach should be able to do those. Once you get to that medium skill, butterflies, stringing rips together, doing things at high volume or even high high skill level, I don't think they need to be able to do them. But <laughs> but they should be able to coach them. Okay. They should be able to teach them. Yeah. And trust me, I've coached movements, whether it be injury or can't do, that you have to find a way to coach it. It might not be the best coaching in the world. Like I know when I coach pistols, I know I don't do a great job coaching them. Um even though I can do them on my right leg right now pretty easily, but on my left, I've tried it twice in the past three weeks. It's my left knee strength is not there yet, so I just fall to the ground. Yeah, but you know how to do them. You've done them, right? I've done them, and like I and the, but and now I, I feel like I've gotten better at coaching them and showing scaling options because that's a big part of, of coaching or progressions, right? Or be able to explain. Here here's a thing that I think a coach should, in relation to skills that you just talked about, gymnastic skills, right? You need to be able to explain different components of every movement. And what helps, the fact that you can't do one, that should actually help you coach someone, right? If I can't do a toes to bar or I can't string five reps together, you need to know why you can't, right? I'm not telling you to go fix it, but why can't? So like, why can't I do a pistol on my left leg right now? The stability around my hip joint, left the hip joint, is very weak. My, my muscles there are very underdeveloped. So all this pressure goes to my left knee. And my left knee is banged up still. There's some structural stuff in there that is still not fully back. So that by the point, so I'm putting all this pressure on a, on already weak kind of beat up joint, and I don't have enough stabilizer muscles to support to come up uh, to make up for that shortcoming. So when I get to a certain point, I just fall, and it's not so. But other people, it's. Uh, dorsiflexion in the ankle. Your ankles are so tight, you can't keep your heel on the ground. Other people, it's f you're just not flexible enough. If you can't get your hamstring to get near your calf or when you do a, a quad stretch, that's a huge shortcoming. And in the, like that should help you coach. Like if I can't do toes to bar, right? Is it my lat strength? I can't lean back further enough. I can't get the angle of my arm to be uh, a little bit more acute to the, to the ground. Or so that's a lat strength issue. Or hey, your core is not strong enough to lift your legs up. That might be a big thing. So, but do you understand that? And can you be humble enough to maybe even use yourself as an example? Like I, I Mike Del Toro does a great job of this. He will. He has no issues telling his entire class is like I, I suck at this part. I can't do it. But hey, this is how you do it. You know, this is why I can't do it. That that's that's a big part of coaching to me. I I can't emphasize that enough. I believe that was one of my biggest points for today was co good coaches should know how to scale and use their life experience. So someone who is a naturally gifted athlete who never had any issues with this and is like RX bro or or, right. or go home, right. the fact that you had to struggle on that left knee, yeah. the fact that recently, you know, like for the past couple of weeks, I've been sort of babying my shoulder and yep. rehabbing it. Mm -hmm. And I've been doing all these scaled progressions in the wads. And that gave me so much more insight over the past two weeks about doing ring rows, about doing bear crawls, about doing all these movements. And honestly, most athletes are not RXing everything. Mm -hmm. Most, if they're doing it properly, are going to be scaling more. You'll see more scaled numbers up there than RX most days. Yep. And if you don't know how to, you know, personal experience is such a strong um you know, fountain of knowledge for coaches. Like you can actually teach people stuff so much better if you've gone through that. Mm -hmm. And that's actually made me think this past two weeks about, you know, how do I do my scales better? Mm -hmm. How do I bring more intensity to the scaled movements? So that you get the stimulus. So you can get the stimulus because I'm doing these movements. And I'm like, wait a second. I feel like it can be more yeah. without in upping the skill level, but increasing the intensity. So yep. I'm thinking about how do I do those things? Yep. And those are... Um, Mo more important than necessarily being able to do every movement cleanly or flawlessly yeah. as, as a coach. Yeah. So one of my kind of philosophies on coaching athletes, right? Because this is a struggle for a lot of coaches that also train to be an athlete, like you're really pursuing something. I believe they don't need to be separate. Not everyone agrees. There's some good coaches that don't agree with it. Like I've had a, 
a, a former coach of mine say, if you're really pursuing your top level performance, you can't coach. I'm like, ah, well, we'll see. I mean, I, I don't think about that. I don't think that's true. But, and this is because of this philosophy. If you are trying to become a better coach, truly, and what is a coach? You're helping others, right? It should help you become a better athlete. If you are truly trying to become a better athlete and you're trying to find all these ways, like what you just talked about, that should make you a better coach. Like, I really do think like it's a, like a, you know, the relationship is they both go up together. And I do feel like in some ways, other than just getting a little older and, and having to, you know, balance my life out a little bit, I do feel like in a lot of ways I'm a better athlete. And because of that, things have worked because I'm not a natural with a lot of things. It's asked me, it's helped me become, or maybe even gave me more potential to be a better coach, right? You still have to capitalize on things and put it into practice. But you, like right now, you just broke everything down. It's like, I'm thinking about how to get this movement a little bit more intense without jeopardizing your shoulder. I'm thinking about trying to get my shoulder back to 100%. That's really a lot of what it takes. It's just putting yourself into these deep thought, critical thinking stages. So in terms of movements, guys, like, you know, I hope we answered that a little bit. But like, how about this? Loads and just the percentage of a workout that's RX. And let's say we use the open as our gauge. All right, so there's only three workouts a year now because you know every gym is so different with programming. Like we saw Mayhem's programming from Waldwick. Like a lot of people couldn't RX those workouts, right? Right. Um, so I don't want to use them as a gauge. I don't even want to use Bison as an as a gauge. What is there a percentage? Does one exist? Is there a template answer for hey, if you're a coach in CrossFit, you should be able to do X amount of workouts RX? What do you think? Well, again, what, let me ask you this. I'll throw out a comment, see what you think. In terms of loads, people have said I expect good lifts from a coach at a percentage of their body weight, good form and technique. Yeah, so like, because, and when they say a percentage, you know, no one's gonna say you need to go snatch your body weight. No, no, but, no, But you should specific. be able to back squat your body weight, right? Like there, for every lift, there is a percentage out there that you should be able to lift. That's what that comment is, I think is saying. Correct. All right, um, so yeah, I mean, you have to, on this podcast, I'm not gonna go break down every single lift, like your deadlift, you should be able to body, you know, right. 150% of your body weight for, for three, I'm not gonna go down that road. This is what I think in relation to loads. Whatever your one rep max is, and I don't really care about your body weight and what percentage it is. I care more about whatever your true max is or approximate maxes of any lift. Can you move it for three reps at 90%, you know, five reps at 85%, six reps at 80%, like, and it look good. That's what I care about in relation to loads. Now, you're saying, Dave, that you're talking about a quality movement discussion and we'll probably get to that at some point i'm not i'm talking about a percentage of your true max can you still move it well for multiple reps or does it start to break down that's what i look for in coaches and i come up short here sometimes like if i go for a really heavy clean sometimes i get a little wonky with where i catch the bar where my feet end up especially on a power clean you do too right starfish oh, totally and um you know you fix it i'm not no one's action uh, asking or expecting perfection but I think there needs to be some breaking down. And I've seen this with coaches where they're, they're probably biting off more than they can chew with certain loads and certain movements, certain percentages. And I think that's something a coach should be cognizant of that. Hey, what if the entire gym was watching you work out right now and they were going to check you if, hey, is he doing what he tells me to do with quality movement and reaching a stimulus? I try. Sometimes I don't. Yeah. <laughs> How about this? How about for cardio? It says. Cardio should be better than average. I find it hard to take advice from someone if um, they have, you know, long times or bad splits mm -hmm. for uh, for those type of cardio pieces. Splits, I think that's just a, a CrossFitter thing. CrossFitters suck at splits. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> um, you know, this is going to get to some stimulus talk. All right. I mean, does a CrossFit coach need to run a sub seven mile, sub eight mile, sub nine mile, do Murph in under an hour, whatever? Um, I, th I do think because conditioning is – a bigger portion of CrossFit programming than strength. Me personally, I'd rather, if I had to pick a physical trait of a coach, I do want them to be well-conditioned. Okay. All right, Dave, what is well-conditioned? Like, here we go. <laughs> you know, you should be able to get through most CrossFit workouts with a consistent pace. There you go, right? Like, that, like you shouldn't be falling apart six minutes in. And that might mean slow down a little bit at the start, right? But if you know that anything more than six, seven minutes, all right, or anything that has a cardio feel to it, if you know you fall apart, I'm not talking about where you rank, right? Because that's that's too 
based on external factors that have nothing to do with how good of a coach you are, right? That, that's more about other people than yourself. We're talking about yourself. If you fall apart and can't maintain pace, you can't, you have no attention to your aerobic system, right? That's where I think it's an issue and you should check yourself as a coach. Now, I want to bring this up now. It's going to come up again later. If you're going through something physically, an injury, of course. a sickness, sure. right? Like I'm not, that does not pertain to you, all right? Just, I don't want any coaches getting offended by that, right? But generally speaking, if you are a you know decent version of yourself right now, right, with health injuries, right, you should not be falling apart in the middle of a workout because you can't breathe, all right? So I think, I think that's the one thing I do feel strongly about when it comes to performance. Do you agree with that? I agree. Okay. I mean, people go up and down with this stuff. Listen, and you, yeah. could you find coaches who are sort of, at a low point, like you said, for right. whatever reason. I've been there. Yeah, and then you could be like, look at look at Sam. He's not, you know, like he's dying at like minute 10 into the workout. This week, you scaled a lot this week. Oh, so much. And you're probably going to continue to do that because you're trying to rehab your shoulder. Yeah. So, yeah, no one has any right to look at Sam like, dude, that guy can't even do the wall-facing straight hand Sam push-ups, and he's a quarter finalist that's been coaching for a while. Like, come on. Like, you got to know the situation. And, again, we're not saying this from a judgmental perspective, but that is where this discussion started. Is an athlete said a coach should be able to do things. Yeah. So this is where we are going to defend the coach a little bit. If you're going through something, a shoulder injury or a shoulder rehab, whatever you want to call it, um, you know the, the the people around you kind of need to be aware of that, right? No, you're not gonna you don't have to make a post about it or you know tattoo your forehead saying like, <laughs> hey, just because you beat me today doesn't mean anything. I'm rehabbing my shoulder. We don't want to go down that path, but I believe that coaches deserve some grace there throughout the year that. They're not always going to be the best version of themselves, whether it's out of gym stuff, whether it's an injury that they're rehabbing. But generally speaking, from a macro, a year-long perspective, Sam, even though he's rehabbing shoulders right now, usually embodies a well-conditioned athlete more often than not. All right? Uh, so, But what should a coach should embody? This is where I'm going to put pressure on a coach. And I only apply pressure to a coach because I feel this pressure 24-7, 365, and I mean that. Okay, here are the five things we could break them down a little bit. Quality movement, pursuit of stimulus, attention to detail, coachability slash respect, and then long-term goals with actions that align with them. Okay, those are the five things that I think a good coach that is actually trying to walk the walk and not only give the whiteboard talk a good warm up and maybe even a good cue or two when you're coaching, that's part of your job. The other part of your job, which could you could make a case is equally as important as the classes you're coaching are those five traits right there. I'm going to say them again quicker. Quality movement, pursuit of stimulus, attention to detail, coachability slash respect, long-term goals and actions that align with them. So Sam, now put your coach hat back on, mm -hmm. all right? You don't have to remove yourself, okay? Mm -hmm. Do you think you embody these five traits as a coach? I try. Yeah, okay, <laughs> I good. Try. Honestly, that's all, that's all I care. I mean, I will say, from my perspective, you do. And I think, you know, most coaches I know that are good coaches do this too. You know, consistently 24-7, 365, probably not. I mean, I know my movement sucks sometimes. So, But again, the intent. And only the coach knows. That's where I think the pressure really is on the coach. You know, and like we're so into this, like, what do people think about me? Do, you know, that's where a lot of coaches get insecure with, with their workout scores, performance, their aesthetics. You need, you can answer this question. Like, if you're a coach, you can answer this question right now. And don't be pathological liar about it. Can, do you embody those five traits? So quality movement, Sam. Uh, whether it's yourself or other coaches, or you can use yourself as an athlete perspective, you know, does it bother you when you see a coach move like shit? Not even in this gym. Like if you drop in somewhere and you see a coach drop, move like shit or on Instagram, right? Does yes, that bother you? Very, very much so. Same here. Yeah. Like it bothers me deeply. I mean, if you're not – more importantly, I mean – it, it really it, that's a snapshot of somebody. Yeah, obviously, and mm -hmm. it, you know, if you saw me when I first started CrossFit or when I first started coaching, that's a snapshot, and you would expect, like you said, progression and improvement. That's mm -hmm. what you mentioned before, right. and I can't emphasize that that's exactly what 
people should expect from coaches. So mm -hmm. if some of my movements are better than others. For sure. And everyone, everyone. And there are some movements that I struggle with. And I think all coaches are never perfect at everything. Mm -hmm. We all struggle with certain things. Mm -hmm. So you could probably program or pick out a workout for me and I would look really bad mm -hmm. doing it. Yeah, yeah. But, but the issue is, is that coach also trying, just like they are athletes, to improve and work on what they're doing. Yeah. And if you see that, then I would expect you would think that they have good qualities as a coach. And you can even keep this as standards, right? Like we, we've done a lot of talk on standards. We always will because I think it's a really important thing. And it's a person, standards to me are as much about personality trait than it is a physical trait, right? Um, quality movement can be like, do you hit the points, but like, do you hit all those points of performance, all the standards? Like when you squat, do you get below parallel? Unless you got an issue, right? Do you lock out your elbows? Unless you got an issue. Um, you know, do you extend at the top of a burpee? You know, we did a nasty burpee workout the other day. I videotaped my whole one because I wanted to see splits. And uh, it was that Friday workout, the burpee, pull up, burpee, jump rope, burpee, toes to bar interval workout. Yeah. And one of the things I was looking for was like, do I actually extend everything at the top of the burpee? And I've, I've been on the other side where I'm like, oh, I didn't do it. But that, like, my intent is I got to do it right. And you got to be honest with it and humble about it. Like, all right, you know what? I need to make that better. So it, it could even just be like, you know, I'm never going to look like Nick Squire when I snatch. That, that dude moves so well, right? It's, like, fun to watch him lift. It's pretty, love right? Love it. Love it. Uh, I'm never going to look like that. But I am trying. Like, that is one of my goals is to really improve the quality of the movement, all right? P the biggest thing on here, well, I don't want to rank these, but pursuit of stimulus is big to me. Um, as a coach, you know, when I coach other coaches, that's one thing I'm actually looking for is w will they scale when they, when they should scale, right? Um, you know, and if someone arcs as a workout that they shouldn't in and they have a strong reason behind it, cool. Like I'm, I'm cool with it. That's attention to detail. You put thought into it. But if it's like, nah, dude, like I've been arcs in the workouts for six years. Like I'm just going to arcs it. Well, you suck at those two movements and now you're not going to get the stimulus of the workout. And this is something we struggle with as coaches all the time. People overshoot, overextend themselves. And if you have the coaches <laughs> overextending themselves, it's going gonna, it's gonna to trickle down. So every workout has a stimulus. And I know not everyone is a natural at what is the, today's stimulus? What is today's feel? What should, I, what should I be aerobic, anaerobic? Should my splits be the same? Does it not really matter today? I do my best on the write-ups um, when I'm talking at the whiteboard to really explain like, hey, use this weight. But if you can't do six in a row on Wednesday, shoulder overhead wall walk workout – you should scale the weight, right? If you are in round, if you're in the first third of the workout and you're breaking them up because it's too heavy, you fail to hit the stimulus of the workout. So thoughts on that? We have a lot of RX bros, <laughs> just yeah. like every other gym does. Right. And it's RX or bust. And forget if whether you're finishing under time cap or you only finish 50% of the wad under time cap, but you still RX it and that's all that matters. And I've been guilty of that time and time again myself. Mm -hmm. And it is a, it is a struggle. Not you, that often. Though. Um, I, think, I know. I, I mean, I, I know. We're trying to like not come across as preachy. We, right. like, that's some, just so you know, Sam and I are always like, let's make sure we're not coming across preachy. Right. But we do have anecdotal advice. And it's just a struggle because you're dealing with your ego. Yeah. And it is hard not to put your RX up there. And I know a lot of athletes who feel that way. Mm -hmm. If you're a coach and you don't, practice what you preach when you go there, mm -hmm. you, not only are you not helping others, but you're going to hurt yourself. Right. I mean, there are certain times where you want to cut loose. Mm -hmm. You want to see what you can do. Yeah. You, you know, let the regulator off and, and go for it. Mm -hmm. And sometimes coaches will help you. They'll say sometimes, listen, this one, I think you should RX or you should go for it. Like, you know, but most of the time you have to figure out what that is. And if you can't figure that out for yourself, you know, and someone's like telling, like telling you, dude, I'm just going to go for it. Mm -hmm. And if you're just like, not, not even giving one piece of like information about it, like, you know, that this is this, this, and this, right. and you know that usually you're doing this. Right. So think about that. Right. I mean, I, you, you and I never will tell someone not to, like if they're gung ho about something, unless we're about to see them run into a brick wall. Yeah, if it's a safety thing, <laughs> right. it's different. But most of the time we're going to let athletes go. Yeah. But on the other hand, athlete, you know, if you are an athlete yourself as a coach who doesn't know what that is, mm -hmm. it's hard to give good advice to athletes that also don't know what that is. Right. And, you know, I'm proud of a coach when like I had, a, I've had a couple coaches 
over the past couple of years, said like, hey, like I'm probably I'm going to scale every open workout this year, and they, they've never done that before. And I'm like, I'm proud of you for, say, for doing that and saying that because I know it's not always easy, right? There's some ego involved in it or just some acceptance of where you're currently at, and I know it's hard. I've been there too. But when a coach comes up to me that normally RX is a workout, let's so say 75% of the workouts, like, and they scaled for whatever reason, right? I'm proud of them for saying that because I still think there is a problem in this gym and in CrossFit in general that scaled is perceived as bad. Because I still, to this day, when I write, I write down everyone's score when they come to the gym, you hear a score and like, but I scaled. I'm like, it's not but you scaled. You just scaled, right? <laughs> like, like I, I can't wait until maybe it'll never happen. Maybe it will. Where it's just, that's not the result, right? Like you worked hard and hit the stimulus, right? Maybe someday there will be a better way for us to record this. Maybe we don't write down our scale sometime, you know? Um, we talk about that all the time. I think about it all the time, you know? Um, that's be a pretty cool podcast topic to maybe talk about, like different ways to record workouts that you kind of get away from that RX scale. Like here, example, we've done workouts with, there is no RX weight. Just pick a weight, go for it, right? Um, body weight, or just pick a weight that you feel like moving today, and you could tell there's a different feel when some people get their scores because what they do, they hit the stimulus. Good job, awesome. Um, the only time I would say, hey, you failed to hit reach the stimulus and it's okay, is if you were testing yourself. Like I kind of want to see if I can do this. Oh, I failed. Okay, like now I know, and that's okay. All right, uh, but if it's the majority of your workouts, I think that's a bad job by the coach. I also think athletes should not be looking at coaches and be like you know what, they're only doing 55 on those cleans. And I'm always doing 65. Yeah. So they're not good. They just right. keep scaling everything. Yeah. Like, maybe that's not the point of that person's workout. Yeah. You know, I remember I made a post about this long time ago on the Bison Instagram. And, you know, it's, uh, if the, if the, your score was the quality of the movement, not your, how many reps or what your time was, would you approach your workouts differently? You know, and that's a very subjective way. So we can't really do it. Like, hey, you got a six out of 10 today, you know, uh, on your quality of snatches and handstand push ups. But um, maybe that coach that usually less weight than you moved so much better and got a better stimulus and safer workout than you that used 65 pounds, you badass, right? Um, and, but you moved it like shit and you're kind of sore the next day and you really didn't get that much better at any quality movement. The coach got the 55 pounder got the better workout. Absolutely. So that's something. You know, you can't always use surface level observations like a weight on a barbell or a score on a whiteboard to say who did the better job. I mean, you shouldn't go there in general who did a better job. But if you can't help yourself, you can't use only the score and the weights on the board. The other thing is, is that I would say 95 percent of the time our coaches move fantastically well and you don't even see what happens on the whiteboard for example i remember the other day i've used this example a bunch of times it was one of those weight progressions where you move up yeah uh like have you know and you just record the heaviest weight yep. for something yeah and adam storms started at like everyone starts at like 95 or 75 the overhead, the overhead workout i can't remember it was trick press push press push it was trick. like it was a year ago oh, oh it was okay, really okay, long okay. time yeah, yeah. Okay. and i remember um he started at like 75 or everyone starts at like 75 and then they finish at like 155 or 165 or 185 or something. He started at 135 and he did the whole workout at 135 and he recorded 135. Yep. And you know what? You didn't see on the whiteboard what his performance was, yeah. but I watched him do it. Yeah. And I was like, that was 10 times harder than me starting at 75 and doing one last rep at yeah. 175 yeah. Oh. <laughs> and looking better than him. And I thought, Classic. Like, and I told myself, this is where you don't see what's going on right. in real life. Right. Look at what these coaches are doing and judge based on that. Right, right. Yeah, that's that's a great example of a situation like that where the, the numbers on the whiteboard don't tell the story. Um, attention to detail. So what I mean by this is, and th this is hard for me to talk about because I know like I'm a numbers guy with a lot of things like percentages, paces, reps per minute, how long am I resting in between, um, like I had a very specific goal in a workout that I just did bison, the one that I just talked about Friday squad, the burpee toes bar, burpee pull up, jumble under. I had a very specific like goal that I was going for. Um, uh, but I'm, I'm, it's natural and easy for me to look at a clock and know exactly how long that round took. Like, I don't need to write down the splits. I just knew. Right. Um, and I knew if I tripped up once, it was six seconds slower than the previous, like all that stuff that comes from a lot of experience, but it also comes from I am I do know that I need to get everything out of every workout for me to move the needle and get better. And every little details matters. Like how many steps I took from my burpee to the pull-up bar the other day. Like that mattered to me. Liz told the story that Adam Ramsden was doing burpees 
um, and every rep taking another step closer to his jump rope so that by the time he was done with his burpees, he was at his rope. He was, and he crushed the workout that day too. That's attention to detail, right? Um, so if a coach, I believe, and this actually helps you become a better coach when people start asking for advice, you know, uh, if I want to get better at Fran, we can't just say try harder on your thrusters and your pull-ups, right? It can be like, hey, your thrusters, you get them done pretty much one rep every two seconds. So you're only going to be doing 42 seconds of thrusters. So if you know you're going to rest for 10 seconds, you should be off that barbell at the 55-second mark. You know, like the, a coach, some athletes would be like, wait, wait, what? <laughs> What'd you just say? That's attention to detail. How long does a thruster take? About two seconds. If they're a little bit slower, squatter, maybe three. Right? How long does a wall ball take? If you told the entire gym to go on one minute of unbroken wall balls, everyone would probably get between 30 and 35 reps. Like that kind, Those kind of details, they help a lot. And then you get into the machines, like your paces on machines and all this stuff. Attention to detail is a big part of being a coach. And if you apply that to your workouts as an athlete – and start to really break things down, write some things down, I, I, it's going to help you out a lot. You know, there are a lot of athletes, and I've been one, who you hear that from the coaches, and you're like, okay, whatever, I'm just going right. to go. It doesn't and always I, click. I'm going to go hot. And and that's fine, but mm -hmm. at some point as an athlete, you're going to want those details, or you might be receptive at some point. Right. And once you actually do start thinking about it, even if you're a very casual athlete, start thinking about those things, it will help tremendously. Yeah. So... Coaches keep giving that information, right. even if people don't seem to be registering and they're just going out hot as F. Right. Um, and then athletes, at some point, you might be receptive to that information and you might start incorporating it into your workout. Tomorrow right. might be the first day you actually do. Absolutely. You know, uh, give it a shot. Yeah. Um, and that, if you want to take, you know, we're two meatheads talking about working out. Like, let's take the workouts out of it, your nutrition. Like, if you want to get into macros, like, those one, two, three hundred, you know, hundred grams of, uh, or sorry, calories – they matter at the end of the day. If you're trying to fix something with your your body weight or your body fat or your energy levels or your recovery, right? If you're prescribed to eat 180 grams of protein a day, but you're only eating 140, that's like every single time you eat, you came up about maybe seven or eight grams short. Not a big deal in the moment, but those little details, they add up. You do that every week, every month for a few years. Yeah, maybe you're the person that can't recover. If you're eating you know, 20 grams of carbs extra every single day, not a big deal, right? Like I had a couple of jelly beans before I came to the gym today. And and, um, nice <laughs> Easter candy's still sitting in that cabinet. Um, but you know, if you do that every single day or a couple times a day, you multiply it by you know 74 days over the course of the year, then like, hey, maybe those are the five pounds you wish you could lose, right? Maybe that's why you struggle with gymnastics. Like, you, you all these little details about how many, how much, what you're doing before you go to sleep to get ensure that you get a good night of sleep. Like these details can go into all these different angles of your life. And a lot of the changes that people want, they're not drastic. Like a lot, they're not. It's just a bunch of little baby steps that add up to something. So that attention to detail as a coach can help you out so much, but can help you really help others, right? I think a lot of coaches need to take that on. It's like when we tell you to have attention to detail, yeah, I care about you, but I actually care about you coaching others more than that. And I think that can really help you out there. Um, coachability and respect. Um, you know, this is tough for a coach sometimes. Um, you know, you're the one in charge, especially if you coach a lot, right? If you're a head coach or you're a full-time coach, you need to be able to be coached yourself. You know, like I hired a coach for a few years for this reason. I was like, I thought I was getting too biased towards what I think is right. And I loved getting the different perspectives from different coaches. Um, that, you know, if you are not a coachable athlete yourself, whether you just don't listen, if a coach comes here, if a coach comes up and tells you, you know, take 20 pounds off your bar, hey, you're gonna, you should scale this workout and you don't do it, you're not coachable. What do you think? Yes, I agree. But it's hard both on, on both sides. So it's hard to coach coaches. It's hard, it, it is. Yeah. And I, I've had you in my class yeah. and I don't really say much because I'm not sure what to say exactly. Well, yeah. I mean, whatever. I mean, so <laughs> like, I'm actually hoping to get to your class Thursday morning. I mean, I'm literally at that point now. I have to like <laughs> map out every hour, but give me an example because I've come, I think to you two weeks in a row. Yeah. Um, recently just a thruster cow row workout. I'm still sore from that thing. Um, do you ever see something in me that you're like, you know what, I think he should be better at this? Uh, only one thing. What? Uh, you talk too much in the warm up with Nick Squire about <laughs> golf and stuff. And I'm like, please shut the F up. <laughs> well, hey, I mean, that's like, that is, that's a real thing, right? Like, and that's a respect. Like, maybe I was being disrespectful. Uh, I, I know. You're just bro talking. Yeah, but no, but still, like, yeah. I, I will say, I'm calculated with when I do talk. This is something that comes up a lot with coaches. And it's not necessarily about other coaches, but we do get frustrated. 
when there's like side conversation as you're trying to teach something. Now, I'm pretty diligent about not talking during like the really important coaching components. But if we're warming up and like we're in the middle of like a leg swing set, we start talking and then you start talking about, you know, the importance of a leg swing. Like I probably will keep talking. Maybe I shouldn't. But if Sam really doesn't want me to, I won't. (laughs) <laughs> I mean, I'm not going to sit there and tell you like tips to as you're attempting your 275 clean, right? But yeah, and but I'm still looking. Like there, when I do coach other coaches, I still look at. I actually look at them more carefully in some ways, just because I'm like they're generally moving very well. Yeah. So what is it that I can still pull out or, mm-hmm. or give? Because I yeah, think I'm that's trying to what, think of an example. That's right one now. of the hardest things for me to do is to see pe- people and point out faults well right because i think a lot of people actually move pretty well at our gym but there's always stuff you can pull out right so so that's the same thing when i'm being coached yeah is generally speaking i i am looking for that as well so but it's hard and i think from the athlete perspective right like me the guy that was talking too much on thursday morning it's like all right now it's like sam just says that like if i do come this thursday like i need to know that like just don't talk while and like if there is like hey guys you got five minutes to work out that's your time to talk Right. Um, like I'll tell you when I'm not talking, it's during my workout because that's about me. But when you're in a class as a coach, it's not about you. Right. Like you really do have to. And maybe like, you know, the other day, like I should have just kept my mouth shut when we were talking about golf, although we're so pumped for it. <laughs> I'm very excited. Uh, <laughs> um, but that's 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 a big sign to me that if a coach does tell you like what Sam just did to me, like if you do it again, it's a problem. That could mean you're not coachable. Like you think you're too important to listen to rules that you want others to follow. And again, what are we talking about? We, what are these traits that we want a coach to embody and what other athletes should expect of that coach, right? Like coaches, there are eyeballs on you. If you don't embody the things that we want you to do, it's a, you are reflecting poorly on yourself as a coach. That's what I worry about because you have so much respect at the gym. Mm-hmm. What you do during my class yeah. reflects on the class, but it reflects on me too. Absolutely. Because you're one of the biggest, you are arguably the biggest part of the gym. Right, so. right, yeah. Um, so now here's the last one about this. What should a coach embody? The long-term goals and the actions that align with them, right? Does a coach need to have a long-term goal? That, that's the first question I should ask you. Every, everyone should, including coaches. Yeah, so the answer is yes. Yes. You should have a long-term goal. Yes. Um, what is long-term? You get to decide. It's your long-term. You know, It might be the end of the summer that's coming up. It might be for the Open next year. It might be for the next time you're in a new age group, which is three years from now. Like It really can be anything that you want. Should they have coaching goals that are long-term? Like in terms of what quality of a um, being a better coach. Yeah, I think a coach should always try to be a better coach. Okay. If a coach ever thinks like they're a good enough coach and they don't need to work harder, that that's a really poor job by that coach. What are your coaching long term goals? So I would, I mean, in terms of like, I do want to get better at coaching skills, like the actual skills. Like there are more people than I thought that got really into the handstand workout. They really want to know handstand. I right now I'm not in a great spot with how to teach a handstand. Like there's a few things I'm trying to pick up on myself. I mean, I'm not very good at myself. I can walk, but like stay still is really hard for me. And there's gotta be something I'm missing. So I'm trying to, you know, research on my own, apply it to myself as an athlete selfishly, but also can I use that anecdotal advice to help them as a coach? Um, and I do feel like I haven't done a great job over the past few years for whatever reasons of not helping people progress in skills rope climbs ring muscle ups handstand walks um stringing together toes bar now a lot of it it's tough because a lot of it is like the person just can't do it yet they're they're not there right they want to be but they're not and there has to be a baseline level so there's a couple athletes right now like i'm kind of just like using them as a case study a little bit it's like all right I'm really going to try these things out with this person because i know there's someone in our gym that's i have a feeling is going to get a muscle up within the next like three months but I don't want to just tell them to go try. I want to try these like three, four, five steps and see if I can apply that. So that's one of my goals is to like, and I don't feel that way. I don't want that to come across as a, a kind of like a template soft answer because I don't feel that way about Olympic lifting. You know, right. like I don't. Right. I, I, and it's not that I don't feel it's important. I do think I need to get better there, but I want more of my attention on, hey, I want Dave to be the person I go to if I'm close to a ring muscle, but something's cl- not not clicking. And that, that's what I want to get better at. Yeah. We all have strengths and weaknesses as coaches, and we all work on our, quote, weaknesses to be better at. Right. Them. I mean, personally, 
it, it took me a while just to get the group management part of things going. Logistics, yeah. And, uh, and that was one where... You've thrown yourself in the fire, though. Because co- you coach the toughest classes of the day. Yeah, I feel like coaching 20 to 26 people a day, like for a class... At 5 and 6 a.m. too. Yeah, will we'll help you get better or you're going to suffer yeah. pretty pretty handily. And I've done both, but... Right. Um, and now Saturdays every now and then. Right, so... It's, it's a different level. Yeah, group management skills have gotten better. I think the issues it still always is going to be pointing out, or like finding flaws in 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 athletes and mm-hmm. looking at it like I don't want to get to the level of like an L2 where you're just like nitpicking at stuff right but on the other hand there is stuff that I know that I could help athletes with mm-hmm. but you know that's just something I have to keep watching yeah. athletes and sort of and also watch other coaches I, I look at all of you guys when you coach yeah. and when you guys give correction to others I I'm like zooming in on that, like I pay a lot of attention to that because that's very important to me. Yeah, yeah, great. Um, so we have a couple things left here. Um, so now we kind of just like told the coaches like, hey, some pressure you should feel, you know, um, those five traits that we talked about. Athletes, it's your turn. <laughs> <laughs> um, why, why athletes need to avoid judging how good slash bad a coach is. And everyone has some judgy in them. Right, some more than others, mm. some a lot more than others. I'm always very judgy. <laughs> um, do you? Here's the thing about like you. You come to the gym, and you see someone for an hour, all right, or less, and we're big on the hour is important here. The other 23 hours are more important, right? And they all kind of like should add up together to make yourself the healthiest version you want to be, right? Do you critique lifestyle the same way? You know, I, I want to use the word critique, but I don't want to use judge because I do think there is an expectation for the lifestyle of a coach. You know, I have seen coaches that are without a doubt unhealthy people, right? And mm-hmm. I'm talking from a big picture perspective, not like the the summer binge, the weekend binge, the vacation binge, like going through a rough spot, stressed out, got a lot of stuff going on. I stress eat, I stress drink, like. I, again, that's the extreme to me. I'm just saying your normal day-to-day lifestyle, you can see someone's – it's obviously they're not buying what they're selling. And one thing that has made CrossFit successful, in my opinion, and it's something that could be the end of a business, whether it's this one or another one, there's a lot of things that could end it, is that the leaders, they don't, they don't eat what they cook. Right? They, they dish it out, but they're like, dude, I ain't touching that. <laughs> you know, like if I was going to – I wouldn't want to cook for people. I'm not a good cook. So like if I'm going to cook for an, you know 50 people, like I ain't touching it. It probably sucks. I'm going to go to the diner and get something. In different. Like are there coaches that do that? And I think that's where some athletes will only look at someone's score, the load, the movements, the RX, the scale, but they don't put as much attention on like, dude, they're healthy. You know, they're, they're, they're happy. They're glowing. They, they're, they're not, they're never the coach that's injured all the time. Right. That's something I think you need to kind of shift this a little bit, like get away from these short term. What's your score in today's wide? Like who cares? Are they a healthy person? Are they pursuing health? What do you think? Absolutely. It's hard to get to know people's internal lives like that. It is. Um, And a lot of what I see from coaches is, what they do in the gym. Mm-hmm. I don't necessarily know like what is their outside life like. What, mm-hmm. what you do know, so, you do know some though. Some, yeah. Some. But even that, you don't even know everything, right? Yeah. And I honestly, I try not to dig too much unless they offer it to right, me. Right. Like I hate ask questions. Yeah, I hate bugging people about stuff because you might find stuff or that you really didn't want to know or shouldn't right. know or don't ask questions you don't want the answers right. to. <laughs> exactly. And uh, but if they tell me stuff, I'm really happy to hear it. Like right. I want it. I want people to tell me stuff if yep. they want to tell me. Yep. But um, I think you know. Y- but their wad performance and what they do in the gym does reflect that. Mm-hmm. And if someone is, um, it can reflect it. It can. Yeah. Um, I think all coaches should definitely buy into what's going on at the gym at the very minimum. Mm-hmm. So if you see a coach never showing up, like not jumping into, not doing wads, not like doing anything that we're sort of espousing, never showing up during the open, right? That kind of stuff. Exactly. Not supporting others. Right. Not doing any of that stuff. Well, then. You're like, wait a second. What is this coach's role? Do you really believe it? Do they believe what they're saying? Like, you know, raw, open, raw, raw. And then remember like, when we had Tafaro on uh, 
two years ago, a year and a half ago, over a year ago, when we did the like the four part series of yeah. Bison history, Bison or- Origins, and he, I remember him saying this like a uh, something I remember from that was when we started Bison when he left his career in finance, he was in it for a while. You know, he's like, this was like the first product I actually believed in that I was selling to others. Right. Like how many people out there are just trying to sell so they can provide for their family? More power to you, by the way. Right. But you're not like truly believing it. I don't want to ruffle any feathers, but like, you know, there's some industries out there like they are selling to only make money. They're not trying to help anybody. They're just trying to make money here at Bison, whether you're an owner or a coach the money's not big enough to make like go in with that kind of approach. Like there's not a a fiscal advantage to this that like changes your life. Right. But you believe in it so much that it's like almost an easy thing to sell, you know, but if you don't believe in it, it it can easily kind of come across that way. Oh, inauthenticity. CrossFit or smell that a mile away. Right. If you're inauthentic about something. Right. And I I have seen it at other gyms when I've dropped in or seen it like, Listen, and this is why I like CrossFit Bison or one of the strongest points is regardless of what level you're at, a high level of fitness or a low level of fitness, the programming works. Mm -hmm. So there are a lot of places where the high level athletes just don't even do the programming that's offered at all, Mm -hmm. never. Mm -hmm. And, And that's not something that you've ever believed in right even your competitors the ones that are really sort of working to um a very high level of aspiration Mm -hmm. will still do wads yep they may do slightly different you could even say scaling if you wanted to yeah um or they might do additional volume right you know like they might not do six wads we get bison but they pretty much all do three or four yeah and who i mean god i could barely do three or four myself yeah right just regularly like scaled or whatever so so the fact that they are all involved Mm -hmm. and doing it Mm -hmm. like to me if that that shows you the level of commitment from the coaches Mm -hmm. that if they're involved to that extent too yeah and that follows your philosophy absolutely now the I'm a big sports fan, right? If you know me, like, I mean, for example, I talk about sports during Sam's warmups. Oh, I'm going to go like hit myself <laughs> against the wall. But anyway, the, um, I'm really into sports and for, there's a lot of reasons behind that and not going to get into it. But one thing I've noticed, baseball, basketball, football, I don't really follow other sports that much. The best coaches in the world, in history, pretty much none of them were elite athletes some of them have nfl playing careers and they end up coaching after or but like you know bill belichick for example sorry jets fans um the he, he's going to be considered probably the best coach of all time all right or one of them let's say top five okay he never played in the nfl <laughs> he's, a, he's a five foot nine like out of shape guy that's going to tell the best athletes in the world what to do how to do it no matter what and they will listen to him the buy-in is there there's credibility. So like right now you could say, oh, of course, Dave, like he's won all these Super Bowls. They've been the most successful franchise in football for 20 plus years. Um, of course, they're going to listen to him and buy into what he's selling. But you know what? In 2000, 2001, he was a guy that was a former assistant coach that got fired at, from his first head coaching job, did a really bad job. He didn't have credibility back then, but he knew what he was doing. And this is the challenge for the coach too. Like, here's an example. Like, yeah, you don't need to be able to do anything, but you better be able to coach it. And if you can't, then yeah, that is a bad job by you. Um, But the athletes, I want to challenge you guys to use real life examples. Like if you don't want to buy into what we're talking about in this podcast saying like, don't judge coaches and use them and, and compare your scores to them, which we already proved to you that's kind of irrelevant. You know, go use sports as an example. So many quality coaches, the best in the world, are not the best athletes. That's a mistake a lot of CrossFits will make. Hey, oh, you made regionals? Cool, you're a coach. Oh, cool. Like, you look the best with your shirt off? You're a coach. Uh, Oh, you could do 15 on broken muscle ups? You're a coach. You know, we won't do that. Most gyms don't do that anymore, but it's happened in the past. I'm sure it's still an issue out there. But I think the athletes need to pay attention to if a coach is up there, just because they're not a great athlete has almost no bearing. And there's proof everywhere that this is the case. Why is it that the NFL coaches are the least fit looking people in the world? <laughs> you want to know why? Why? I know why. Because they work probably not 18 hours a day. 
Andy like, Reid, Brian uh, Dayball, or whatever the yeah. heck. He's from Franklin Lakes, by the way. These are the fattest guys I've ever seen in my <laughs> All life. All right, well, now he's not going to be on the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's okay. He can explain why his fitness level and his coaching acumen do not uh, yeah, cor- I mean, correlate. Coach Daves, maybe you can come here and we'll, we'll, we'll train you for the summer before the season starts. <laughs> I, I mean, mean, hey, you do see this with coaches. A lot of them do. Like, I mean, Andy Reid, let's use him as an example because I think he's the best coach in the NFL right now, Andy Reid. And he may, like, he's. Hilarious to listen to about. He talks about his like his body shape and how much he eats. He just the dude loves food, but but there's also some coaches like the Jets head coach Robert Sala. That dude is like he's a of a specimen. Yeah, he's, he's really cut. he's a monster, and it's you know I'm not going to get into judging like who does what, but I do know those guys like their their hours that those guys work and the stress they're under is I can't even fathom. I can't even relate to it. Um, I know a couple of people that have worked in the NFL even um, as scouts, right, college scouts, and they travel the country, like they're on the road six days a week, never eating. They're always eating out on the road, in their car, right? It's not a healthy lifestyle. So um, I don't want to get too far off track here, but the you know, the NFL coaches or a coach, you know, the NFL is a very a fit uh, league, a, a, a league of just very um, fit individuals. Amazing that, athletes. Yes, like the best in the world. Um and it's funny to me that sometimes these like you know fifty five year old wrinkly old fat white guys can, can tell like the best athletes in the world and scare them into doing training more, trying harder, running faster, lifting more weight. It's funny. I think on the CrossFit side, it the takeaway really is is keep an open mind as an athlete for any coach. Mm-hmm. Someone shows up and they're a coach, even if you think they're a bad coach or a mediocre coach. If I drop in anywhere and I don't know someone, I will still try to take something from that class. Right. You always can as an right. athlete. Like, don't ever shut your mind off just because you're like, this person sucks. Yeah. I'm not going to do anything they say and I'm not going to listen to anything they say. Right. Like, it's very rare that I'll ever be in a class where I'm going to have to say not, like, everything is is not something I can take away. Oh, for sure. Absolutely. I'll, I'll bet you, I mean, not, like, I bet you if you're a great athlete, like this, and this speaks to you how good of an athlete you are. I bet you if Mal O'Brien showed up to my class, I, I'm like, yeah. she would still probably be able to take something away from For it. Sure. Not because I'm a good coach, right. but because she's an effing awesome athlete. And open-minded. And open-minded. So yeah. I, I think, you know, it's incumbent on the athlete to work to try to get, you know, clear your mind of preconceptions, clear mm-hmm. your mind of, you know, what you think an, a, a coach should be or should do when you're in that class. Take whatever you can out of it. Make that your goal for, mm-hmm. for that class. Yeah. I mean, you can hinder your growth. Like if you do want to make this about yourself, athletes, you will hinder your growth. If you're constantly trying to find something about a coach that can't do something, um, like you're always going to, you know, like, so if you do care about your own personal growth as a CrossFitter, as an athlete, as a healthy person, that's just trying to live longer and prosper, right? You're going to prevent that from happening. If your mind is always going towards what this coach can and cannot do fact. All right. Um, the the mindset of a coach okay so almost we're almost done with this guys i'm just drag down a little bit but it's a good episode um personal experiences from coaching perspective movements was we struggle with we kind of touched on that we coaching when you're injured we've touched on that a little bit coaching when we're not in our best physical mental self we've we've touched on that so the mindset of these coaches that we are normal human human beings too we are not machines we are not robots right we have ups and downs just like you do whether they're mental, emotional, physical. And that's another reason why I think athletes should kind of stay away from these, these you know perceptions of you need to be this caliber of a person, of an athlete. The coach should always care and respect you and do a good job of coaching and running the class no matter what. But in terms of physical performance, the expectation shouldn't always be there. And I, I think that the more we get away from – Always feeling like you have a right to judge a situation. Always, you know, you don't always need to share your opinion. <laughs> I know we live in a, a, a era where you can just go tweet anything out at any point. And everyone's going to read it and like it or hate it and share it, right? You don't need to share the opinions. You just don't. I, I would say almost all of your opinions that come to your head when you're thinking about a coach and quality of class, like keep them to yourself. Because it, in most cases, it's not going to do any. It's not going to move the needle good or bad. You know, sometimes you'll hear people say things about a coach, like where this podcast started from a comment that Sam heard from a person, right? It it, it doesn't do anything. You're not you're not making a difference. You know, you're only sometimes you're only coming across as a douchebag, like uh, one that's a little too full of themselves, right? Like I really think that in a lot of cases, those opinions should just be you know go say it to a wall or go say it to a dog dog, and then you're good to go. You don't have to say it anymore. 
Um, so yeah, kind of like ending this on defending the coach a little bit from that perspective. Do you think that's too strong of a thought? No, absolutely. I believe it a thousand percent. If I, as a coach, I take feedback um, seriously and not seriously. It, it kind of sounds weird, but mm -hmm. like if someone um, complains about a class, or I, you know, and I could sort of tell, like you know, or something doesn't go right, like I do take that into account. Right. But I also don't care. Like right. you know, if someone's like that music sucks. Yeah. I take that into account, but I also don't care. Same. Like it's, or, you know, that that's when I first started the group management issues. Like if I start a class and they don't finish quite with enough time, right. I take that into account, but I also don't care. Like yeah. wh whatever comments people have, mm -hmm. listen, I'm working on it yeah. and I can't take it too personally because right. I know I'm, I'm, I'm imperfect doing what I'm, what I can. With and you're it. imperfect. Right. And yeah. if someone has a comment that I can't change about myself, like, how can I respect Sam if he doesn't know how to string ring muscle ups together? Right. Mm -hmm. You know what? I don't care. <laughs> yeah, like doesn't. I really don't care. And like, that's why I think people need to hear that because <laughs> there are a lot of opinions that even like you, I have and you have, they don't matter. They right. just don't. And not and we're not being condescending. We're not being disrespectful to you. But you have to know, like, it usually those kind of comments stringing ring muscle ups together. The music, it does not matter. So don't talk about it. Yeah, I mean, I, I do try to make the class fun, engaging, try to teach. I try to make myself a better coach. But on the other hand, if I'm not perfect about it, like I realize that, like mm -hmm. it's okay. And if people like, and most people are pretty good about it. Yeah, like, I could, absolutely. I could come in on crutches, and as long as I started the music and Been there. and got there, <laughs> I'd be a, like, people are like, good. I mean, you know, I could look like a werewolf that morning, and it would be fine. <laughs> like, it doesn't even matter. So, so most people are okay. But the people who nitpick at all this stuff, yeah, it's like, you know what? You're not helping the coaches, and the coaches honestly don't give a flying right. crap about right. what you think. Yeah, right. And I, I think that's uh, that that's really important to know. Like, I think I was going to wrap this up with what should. What's one thing I want you want an athlete to walk away with from this podcast, and then one thing you want a coach to walk away from? And I think we just got Sam's opinion on what the athlete should walk away from. Feedback is always warranted. Yes, but you all, but you not have not all types of feedback are bad. Like, no, no, I know. Yes, I know. We'll get a lot of positive feedback, right? Or, um, or constructive criticism. Constructive criticism, right? And you know, just to make sure we're on the same page with what you're saying, it's not that we don't care about your opinion, right? It, we always want to hear what people think about the quality of our coaching, the programming, the gym itself. But when it gets into this overly judgmental stage, right, you have to know that almost all of those opinions are not going to change a thing about that situation. I mean, so you have to ask yourself, do I need to share it? And I don't mind. I welcome it. Like I have a thick skin at this point when it comes to this stuff. So if you do want to tell me my music sucks, please tell me. <laughs> yeah. Just know – I might not change anything about <laughs> right, it. Right. So then you have to ask what's right. the point. But I don't mind hearing yeah. anything. And and I think most coaches at this point, if you're a good coach, you you sh you will take that criticism. You will take the comments. Yeah. But just also know that you may or may not make a difference. Right. Say. Yeah. So it's like when Sam talks about Mike's Viking ship music. Hey, no. <laughs> You know, I've actually kind of grown fond of it a little bit. <laughs> Sam's listening to it on the way on the way to the gym, <laughs> bobbing his head to it. What's a, a takeaway you want a coach to take away from this conversation? Um, you know, regardless of where you're starting, where you are, what you're doing, it's a process. And I understand, you know, athletes will have expectations of coaches physically, capability-wise. They will prejudge you even before you start talking whether you're an awesome coach or not good coach, okay? You, you need to overcome those assumptions and prove that you are doing the best job that you can and that you are a good coach. Mm -hmm. and, and I truly believe no matter who you are, if you care, no matter where you start from, what physical capabilities you have, you know, um, you will, you can become a great coach. Mm -hmm. It may not be as easy for me as it is for Matt Frazier, right. but you know what? I know I could become a great coach. I know everyone can become great coaches. Mm -hmm. And and so don't let anything that anyone else says deter you if that's what you believe in. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I would take away for a coach is that the, the sum of all of your actions are going to dictate whether or not you become a, a great coach, a respected coach. It's not necessarily um, the good days where the movements are in your wheelhouse right. and you're awesome at teaching them. Right. Um, but it's also – not going to be detracted that much for the booms that you're not good at or that the ones that you personally struggle with, right? Or the 
times of your life you're injured, not feeling great about yourself, physically not there, the sum of all the actions over the course of like, let's say a year, really dictate a lot about how much respect you're going to have as a coach. So if you have a bad day, or have a bad week, it's okay. But at some point, you're going to have to turn that into a good week, a, yep. a good week. Yep. You, know, you, you have to keep the standard really high for yourself as a coach. And if you're ever kind of getting away from that a little bit, or you don't think the standard, you, you don't want to uphold that standard as an athlete, you kind of just want to come and wad and disappear, I don't think you should coach anymore. I, I think that's something, a realization that some coaches should think about is if you are no longer want that bar really high and you want all, all eyeballs on your actions and words and even in and out of the gym, if you don't want to do that anymore, I don't think you should run classes anymore. Um, so that's, that's something I want a coach to often think about. And then my takeaway for athletes is, man, what's the one I would say? that one The one takeaway I would take from an athlete is find coaches that you do want to embody. The ones that you do you know, we all like different coaches, different athletes flow to different coaches, right? Whether it's their classes or who they hang out with outside the gym, you know, what, what they look like, what they buy, right? All this stuff, right? Try to find a few coaches and then look deeper than just how they warm you up, what music they play. Because if you really do want to become a better athlete and you find the coach that you really do want to follow, there are thousands of variables that make that coach that person. And they're not always going to be great, right? They're not always like, if you want to embody this coach, but that coach isn't good at snatching, it's okay. You're going to get a lot of different traits from that coach that can help you kind of raise your level. Um, but in the same breath, the coaches that you're not picking to try and embody, trying to f try to find something from them. It doesn't need to be the whole lifestyle. Try to find something from a coach that you can embody and, and improve yourself. And I think if everyone's on that same page with respect, um, everyone's going to get better. All right. Cool. Thanks, guys. We'll see you next week. We have a special guest coming. Thank you, everybody, for taking the time out of your day to listen to the Herd Fit Podcast. Be on the lookout for next week's episode.